I've been blessed beyond the hopes and the dreams of both of my grandfathers. I've been able to see places in the world they only dreamed of and see some of the sights, some of the great sights uh, around the world. I'm so grateful for that. To be born in a day such as this and to be afforded such opportunity to travel. Yet I've missed some treasures. I've missed some treasures really close to home. One lies just 300 miles away. A must see, I'm told for a book lover like me. The Library of Congress. Somehow I've missed it on my trips to Washington. Library of Congress, 500 miles of shelves. A reading room among the most beautiful rooms in the world. In that reading room, 16 bronze statues of history's most notable men look down from the balustrade, look down into the library itself. You'll be happy to know that Moses and Paul made the cut. We don't know what they look like, but they've carved statues for them anyways. And there they are, looking down over Library of Congress reading room. The room is supported by eight massive marble columns representing eight characteristics of civilized life and thought. Philosophy, art, history, commerce, religion, science, law, and poetry. Each column is topped by a, a, a female statue, and then above each statue there's a large tablet that bears an inscription, each inscription chosen by a past president of Harvard University. Above the figure of religion, you'll find a scripture. You'll find Micah 6.8. What doth the Lord require of thee, but thou do justly and walk in mercy, to walk humbly before thy God. Above the figure of science, you'll find a scripture. Psalm 19.1, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. And above the figure of history, a peculiar quote from Tennyson, from his epic In Memoriam. It's, it's remarkable, the last line they chose to put over this statue representing history, it simply says, well, I should read the last, the last uh, strophe of, of Tennyson's immemorial. First it says, one God, one law, one element. And then here's the quote. One far off divine event to which the whole creation moves. The inscription over the pillar of history in the Library of Congress of the United States one far-off divine event to which the whole creation moves. Isn't it interesting to find a reference to the coming of the Lord etched above the Library of Congress? I'm not reading you something from the Da Vinci Code. I'm not reading you anything that's out of context. This is exactly what Tennyson intended when he wrote these words in memoriam. He was speaking of the coming of the Lord. You can check these things if you want. Go to the website for Library of Congress. Do a little bit of digging around. You'll be surprised what's inscribed in the walls of that and other buildings in Washington. I think it's so interesting to find a reference to the coming of the Lord in that place. One far off divine event to which the whole creation moves. And that's my subject this morning. In four words from John, they form the central pillar of the Christian faith. I will come again. Those are the words of Jesus. I will come again. The text is taken from John chapter 14. Let's establish context. It's the Last Supper. And Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in Me. In My Father's house are many mansions or many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto Myself, that where I am, there you may be also. This text confronts the reality of eternity. The reality of eternity. Eternity is not a guess. It's not a theory. Eternity is a reality. You and I relating to eternity, that's a reality. And it's never been easier for us to forget about eternity. 
Because we're packing the present like never before. We're packing it with more data, more information, more imagery, more music, more noise, more communication, more amusement. And we're finding it all less and less meaningful. Never before have we had such access to knowledge and so little understanding as to what it all means. In 2002, TV Guide called the television show Seinfeld the greatest television show of all time. It's been described as the first postmodern television show. It was the show about nothing. It was billed as the show about nothing. In analysis, it ended up being the show about nothing. And isn't it interesting the TV Guide said it was the greatest show of all time? Its theme was life is absurd and without meaning. And it connected. It connected for nine seasons. It made us laugh. It makes us laugh, but it's a nervous laugh. TV has certainly not taken on a higher tone since 2002 when TV Guide said Seinfeld was the greatest show ever. If Seinfeld was the show about nothing, how can we begin to describe our present fare? I give you the Cardassians. I find myself in a rare moment of agreement with the late Frank Zappa who wrote of the slime oozing out of your TV set. Zappa, Zappa said that in nine, he wrote those lyrics in 1976. I wonder what he might write today. Our cultural preoccupation with the minutia of ourselves has put us back in an ancient paradigm where men once thought that the sun and the stars revolved around the earth in our self-absorption, we live as though everything revolves around us. A Christian who becomes engrossed in a selfish now, untethered from eternity, has no context at all. And the loss of context always distorts the Christian experience, unless we see how we live according to the Word of God and through the lens of eternity, unless we see the big picture of what's going on, the way that we live will be an utter distortion of the life that He has called us to. When Neil Postman wrote his scathing assessment of the entertainment industry, I think it was in the mid-80s, he wrote the book Amusing Ourselves to Death. I don't know how many may have read it, but it was phenomenal amusing ourselves to death. In that book, he included a chapter on religion. It was a hard read then and now to read that chapter on religion because it was an assessment taken from an outsider looking in on the Christian faith in the mid-1980s and his context was the portal of Christian television. That's what he knew of the evangelical church that's what he wrote about in his book. And so to prepare for writing his chapter, he watched 42 hours, 42 hours of Robert Schuler, Jimmy Swaggart, Oral Roberts, Jerry Falwell, Jim Baker, and Pat Robertson in preparation for his chapter. Understand this is about two years before that whole world began to collapse and implode on itself. But listen to what he wrote. He said, on television, religion, like everything else, is presented quite simply and without apology as an entertainment. Everything that makes religion an historic, profound, sacred activity is stripped away. There is no ritual, no dogma, no tradition, no theology, and above all, no sense of spiritual transcendence. Nothing that reaches beyond. On these shows, the preacher is tops. God comes out as second banana. It's interesting to me that now, 25, 26 years later, 
almost nothing remains of the six mini empires that claim the gospel for their very purpose of being. They are gone or they are mere shadows of themselves because they lost that transcendent context that even the world could see was missing. Postman was right. There was no sense of spiritual transcendence. It was all about getting your blessing, improving your life, a hundredfold return. It was self-based. It was now-based. It was the ultimate confusion of the sensual and the spiritual. And this is a constant theme for writers in the New Testament. Paul especially, he writes in Philippians 3 and he says, he speaks of the enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly or their senses or their appetites, whose God is their belly and whose glory is their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. Paul goes on then to contrast the sensual, this, this one whose God is his own belly and his own desires. He, he contrasts that with the spiritual. He says in the same chapter, our citizenship is in heaven. And so we eagerly await the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working of that which he is able to subdue, by which he is able to subdue all things unto himself. The sensual the spiritual. We get them confused all the time. More often than not, the setting for it all is a confused context. One that is missing transcendence or missing this whole idea that we are not just here for ourselves or for the moment we were made forever. The moment you lose this idea that there's an eternity to come, that there's an event to come, that there is a Savior to come, your view of this life and this world will be skewed. When we're living for the moment, grappling with the fact that life is a vapor, without a sense of an eternal God and an eternal purpose and an eternal destiny, it leads us to hopelessness and disillusionment. And Paul said the same in 1 Corinthians 15, 19. He said, if in this life only we have hope, we are of all men most pitiable, most miserable, if it's all about this life, we're missing it completely. In Ecclesiastes 3, following the familiar words, for everything there is a season, in that same chapter, we find the reason for man's constant, even godless reach for immortality, trying to find an answer to all of the mysteries of what life is about. In, in Ecclesiastes 3.11, it says of God, He has put eternity in our hearts. He's put eternity in our hearts. It's something God has planted in us. We're hardwired for eternity. Made for forever. We instinctively know that there has to be something beyond death's door. Our mind rebels against the very thought of nothing out there. The old adage speaks well and says the world was made for the body. The body was made for the soul, but the soul was made for God. The world, the body, the soul, for God. When God is excluded, life loses its connection to eternal things. Jesus said, in my Father's house are many rooms, many mansions. And I'm going there. And I will come again. The text confronts us with the reality of eternity. Secondly, the text confronts us with the certainty, the surety of His return. The certainty of His return. I will come again. This truth lies at the very heart of the New Testament. It's not marginal or secondary. It's not a gloss. It's not a misunderstanding. The entire gospel must be cast aside if his return is in doubt. You can set aside the rest of the New Testament. History has shown us that whenever the church has muted this triumphant promise, she has lost her way every time. The expansion of the church in the first three centuries was radical and explosive. Prior to the legalization of Christianity, in Rome, which came in 313 A.D., 
The church was noted, historians say the church was noted for its unstoppable expansion and conviction, overriding conviction, that Jesus was coming soon. That's what drove the church for its first three centuries. And even up to those, the end of those first three centuries, we could still see the miraculous, charismatic works taking place within the body of Christ. They could still be clearly seen in the writings of the early church fathers. The early church expected Jesus to come at any moment. They expected that life could get rough. They expected that they would be persecuted. They comforted, them, they comforted themselves in the knowledge of His soon return and that their persecutions were an indication that Christ's return was near. But as the church moved away from a spiritual, transcendent religion looking for Christ to appear in clouds of glory, opening up forever for them, as the church moved away from that, that spiritual, uh, transcendent religion to an earthly and sensual structure, the coming of the Lord was de-emphasized and the focus shifted from a heaven-sent Christ to an earthbound institution. And you have the rise of the church in Rome and later in Constantinople. You have the rise of a church that loses sight of not only her Savior, but His coming in clouds of glory, the core and essence of her mission, and we descend into what we have called the Dark Ages. The Dark Ages were presided over by the ascendancy of an institutionalized earthly church. Watch out. Don't wish. Don't wish. Don't wish for a politically powerful church. The historical essence of that is bad. The basis of our power has to be power that is transcendent. It has to be from another place. It has to be. Our kingdom has to operate under totally different principles. Or else it will be corrupted if history has taught us anything. That church became increasingly corrupt. The priesthood was bejeweled. It just covered itself up with gold and jewels and riches. It buried the simplicity of the gospel in layer upon layer upon layer of ritual and ultimately, ultimately stripped the people from hearing the gospel in their own tongue and language. Great buildings were built, were, were built ostensibly for the glory of God, but in reality they were symbols of the power of that church institution. In those dark ages, men did not look to the skies for the coming king. They marveled at the rising spires that were reaching to the skies. The kingdom of heaven right here in the earth. A church that could bring earthly kingdoms to obeyance. A church that became incredibly rich and powerful. A church that affected historical just the historical shaping of the map in Europe. This, this church that, that rose up in so much power ultimately became the church that possessed the power to send armies marching and shedding blood, shedding the blood of the very ones they were called to preach the gospel to. Hence we have the Dark Ages and the Crusades and a stain of blood that we in the church are still trying to explain. And there's no explanation. It was evil. I wonder at times if history has taught us anything at all. The angelic instruction following the ascension of Jesus into heaven was so very clear. Acts 1.11, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven so will come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. In the last chapter of the Bible, Jesus says, Surely I come quickly. The last prayer in the Scripture looks to Him. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Tennyson's only error in what he wrote is that he placed the coming of the Lord. He thought of it always in terms of one far-off divine event where the calling of the church is to look to the clouds every day and look with hope and expectation that in any day, at any moment, in any time, He could come. Every revival that has quickened the church out of lethargy in all of history has been characterized by a passionate conviction that we are living in the last of the last days and Jesus could come in any moment. 
our Pentecostal movement, our Pentecostal renewal and revival, which is stunning when you look at it. When you look, do you realize that even within the Assemblies of God, in the year 1960, 50% of Assemblies of God, Pentecostal believers, 50% of them lived right here in the United States. This was in 1960. 50% of worldwide Assemblies of God right here in the U.S. Today we are 65 million around the United States, 2.5 million of whom dwell here in the United States. Do you understand what God has done through this nation, through this church, around the world just since 1960? The growth is unprecedented, which is why theologians, those who study the church, are saying over and over, this is the charismatic century, and the churches that are growing, moving, the churches that are growing, moving on in this brand new century, the churches that are growing around the world are, are classically Pentecostal and charismatic. Why? They have a view that Jesus is coming. Our Pentecostal movement was forged in revival fires that saw a modern reemergence of the teaching of the baptism in the Holy Spirit that people needed to be endued with power from on high to go witness because we were living in the last days and as we went out and witnessed in the power of the Spirit, there would be a revival. People's lives would be changed. We would see a sweeping harvest come into the kingdom of God and Jesus would come. This was the compelling motivation behind the entire Pentecostal movement. The whole idea was he's poured out his spirit as he has in these last days so that we'll take the gospel to the rest of the world and tell them Jesus is coming soon. Brothers and sisters, we must not grow weary in watching. We must not be numbered with the scoffers. Peter said that in the last days, scoffers will come walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Don't we live in that day? And don't we see, if not the scoffing, don't we see some of the same attitude even within the fabric of the church? It's only God's mercy that has granted us the delay. It is only God's mercy that He has not yet come and wrapped all of this up. It's His sovereignty, but the Scripture clearly teaches it is also His mercy. In the same chapter from the text I just read, 2 Peter chapter 3, in verse 9, Peter says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The text confronts us with the reality of eternity. It also confronts us with the certainty of His soon return. But also it confronts us with the subject of his desire. Let me read the text to you once again from John 14. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am there, you may be also. Did the emphasis help? Do you understand that his desire is for you? You're the subject. You're the object of His desire. You're the reason. The lost of the world are the reason. The heart of God longs to see the Gospel preached. There is still about 35% of this world where there is almost no Gospel witness whatsoever. And the Lord has, he has withheld His coming, it seems, until this time because He has been patient, not willing that any should perish. We're the subject of His desire. How often some, uh, some great love story has a twist of tragedy to it. Matter of fact, if you're going to tell a heavy love story, there's got to be some type of a twist in there. Great lovers are 
finally separate or they are, are terribly separated by war or they're separated by class or they're separated by some twist of fate. And then in the movie or in the, in the play, then there's a redeeming moment where if only for a moment the star-crossed lovers come together once again. And how many times has this line been written? I knew you would come. It's the heaviest line in the entire play. It's what the movie's all about. It's that moment and we all go, ah, oh, because we understand that love, real love, desires above all things to be with the beloved. I knew you'd come. I knew you'd come. True love at all costs resists separation. I wonder, do we have a lover's confidence in the one who has loved us with the greatest love the world has ever known? Do we possess a longing of soul to see Jesus? Have we not known or do we not understand that, that Calvary is the ultimate declaration of love, that it cannot be surpassed, that there is not, a message, there's not another message coming? Do we ever dream of that moment when sin's long and dark night of separation will be suddenly over for us and we shall see Him face to face. Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8, For I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure is at hand. Fought a good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. Finally, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day and not to me only, but also to all who have loved His appearing. To all who have loved, some of your versions, Scripture may say, who have longed for like a lover longing to be in the presence of the beloved who have longed for His appearing. When Jesus gathered His disciples at the Last Supper, and that's the context, John 14, their hearts were troubled. Deeply troubled. And the trouble only got deeper as the night went further. Their world was coming apart. They had left everything to follow Him. And at the table, He had suddenly announced He was leaving them. They'd given up everything. And He said He was going. They hadn't seen it coming. They didn't understand. Everything was upside down. Well, everything that night was upside down. The Master washed their feet. That turned protocol completely upside down. That's why Peter utterly rejected it, saying, no, no, wait a minute, this is backwards, this is wrong, this is upside down. And then the betrayer was revealed. And that turned their tight little fellowship upside down, didn't it? He said he was leaving. That turned their future upside down. And then he said that Peter, in the next 24 hours, actually the next 12 hours, Peter would deny him. Would deny him three times. And that turned faithfulness upside down. They were shattered. And he offered them one hope. One hope. One sure and certain hope to a world gone mad. And that hope was not that they would somehow miraculously escape out of Jerusalem to Galilee where they could start over again. That wasn't the hope. It wasn't the hope of some political salvation. It wasn't the promise of prosperity. It was not a hope that they would suddenly find acceptance in the world. These are things that we hope for when we've completely missed the point. These are the things that we long for when we have dropped a biblical context of life and its purpose. 
These are the things that matter to us when we've lost our way. No, the one, the one hope that he offered was cherished among them. And it was this hope that shaped their lives and formed their prayers. Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 12 and 13. He said, oh, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age looking for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He gave them one hope when their world was falling apart. One hope. The blessed hope. It was their only hope. It's our only hope. I never know when I'm preaching if I'm preaching the last call. Because I know he could come at any moment. I never know when I'm preaching if I'm not preaching the last time to somebody who may meet their Maker before this week is past. And so I ask, are you ready for His coming? Are you ready for His coming? Are you longing for His return? Is your heart warmed by the thought or... Is it cold and indifferent? If you close the chapter on end times event because people fight so much about the tribulation. Or have you set your face like a flint before the Lord and say, I am watching. I am watching and I am waiting for you. Are your eyes turned upward? Or do you just treat it like a fairy tale? Can you pray the last prayer in the Bible? Do you? Even so, come Lord Jesus. Even so, come Lord Jesus. And Lord, we bow in your presence and we take stock in our own hearts. Have we ceased to live our lives in light of your return? Have we an, an, an awareness, O oh Lord, that at any moment you could break through the clouds? I was looking at the skies this morning trying to imagine <laughs> what that will be like. When suddenly there's a shout. And I see you. <laughs> I want to be about everything in this life that matters and nothing that doesn't. And I want to be watching. I want to be ready. Are you ready. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, you're not ready. The Bible says if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if you have not taken that step and given yourself to Him, you're not ready. And this morning, Now's the time. This is the place. This is the hour to give Him your life. Do you see your life with, within the context of His soon coming? Is, is the investment that you're making with your life, does it touch anywhere on any of the things of eternity? Are you His light in the darkness? Are you His voice? His feet and hands? He's coming. He's coming soon. And if you don't know Him, you need to know Him this morning. And I'm going to ask you just to quiet your hearts for a moment and bow your heads and ask yourself the question, am I ready? Would you do that?
Do you know him? Are you ready?